Right. So what we've um, heard about quite a lot today uh, so far is about the development of pharmacogenetic technology in the laboratory. And what I want to talk about today is kind of taking pharmacogenetics into practice, um, the sort of thing that you would experience as patients and as consumers on the high street for medicine. So, my name's Kim. I'm doing a PhD at the University of York in the Science and Technology Studies Unit. And that's our um, research unit there. I'm not in this picture. Someone has to take the picture. But this is a recent trip that we had to um, Bolton Abbey. And the Science and Technology Studies Unit is interested in um, the sort of social, ethical and legal um, issues that are kind of brought up by a range of medical technologies, including pharmacogenetics. Now, I came to the Science and Technology Studies Unit from a background in sociology. What, does anyone know what sociology is? Yeah. Perfect, yeah. And that's what I do. And you might think, well, how on earth does kind of medical technologies and genetic technologies fit into how society works? But these technologies are, you know, they're, they're sort of political objects and they come into practice and they become part of society. And that has a whole set of kind of issues that come with it. And that's what we're interested in. Um, and this guy here is my PhD supervisor, Professor Andrew Webster, who's overseeing the work that I'm doing. So my project is looking at um, pharmacogenetics in pharmacy practice across um, different types of pharmacy practice on the high street and in hospitals. And that involves qualitative interviews with a whole range of people from different specialisms. And this is just a really broad breakdown of the sort of people that I'm talking to in my PhD. Um, to say that this is a really kind of broad overview, because if you just take community pharmacy, for example, not all community pharmacists are the same. Some work in large multiples, like Boots, others own their own independent little pharmacies. Um, some have uh, clinical roles, others are prescribing pharmacists. So the, these are really general, massively broad categories. I think perhaps it's quite obvious why I'm interviewing hospital and community pharmacies and the scientists involved in developing the technology. Um, the reason that I'm talking to general practitioners is because they're the most likely people to be the gatekeepers of this technology. So it's really important to get their perspective. And oncologists, what, does anyone know what an oncologist is? What area of medical practice are oncologists involved in? Anyone? Yeah? Cancer. cancer. Yeah, they're cancer doctors, basically. So you're thinking, what, what, why am I talking to cancer doctors? Cancer treatment has been identified as one of the areas in which pharmacogenetics is and will make the biggest impact. I've talked to a geneticist recently who said, it's often the drugs that kill them, kill the cancer patients, rather than the actual cancer itself. And there's a real need to get away from that through pharmacogenetic principles. So that's my sort of rationale behind interviewing these oncologists. So... Why pharmacogenetics, why pharmacy, and why now? We've heard a lot today about um, why pharmacogenetics is important. It's a financial issue. We want to get away from the financial burden of adverse drug reactions. But it's also about patient experience. If we go back to the quote from the oncologist, you know, cancer patients have been given all these drugs which have horrific side effects. So it's about improving patient experience. But why pharmacy? Over the past 20 years or so, pharmacy has undergone some massive changes in terms of the way that it's practiced, particularly on the high street. In the 1970s, people were often going to their doctors to ask about issues that their pharmacist was more than qualified to answer. And this was a huge drain on resources um, because there were loads of unnecessary GP appointments being made. And the pharmacist was kind of standing there twiddling their thumbs, not really doing much at what they could have been doing. Um, as, for, as genetics becomes a much more kind of routine part of medical practice, it stands to reason that pharmacy is going to get involved in this and pharmacy is going to have a role to play. During the 1980s, um, the idea of the extended role of pharmacy came about. And this is the pharmacist that you would recognise today. You know, you go into your pharmacy and he's not just standing behind the dispensing sort of counter handing out medications. They're on the shop floor. They're giving advice about smoking cessation, uh, blood pressure monitoring, dietary advice, etc. And the idea is that, you know, genetic technology and getting pharmacists involved in genetic technology can extend the extended role of pharmacy. So... 
I've talked to a lot of really, really interesting people so far um, through my PhD, and they've given me absolutely loads that I could talk about um, today to you, but there's one thing that I want to focus on in particular, which is the idea of the professional profile of pharmacy and the professional status of a pharmacist. Who's ever heard this phrase, trust me, I'm a doctor? Everyone heard of that? Yeah. Who's ever heard someone say, trust me, I'm a pharmacist? No, no one says it, do they? And there's no reason that people don't say that. Why shouldn't you trust pharmacists? Tr pharmacists are well-trained medical professionals, but they're seen as kind of lower down in status than, say, general practitioners, for example. And there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, GPs train for a longer period of time than pharmacists do. GPs generally have more control over their everyday activities than pharmacists do. They make decisions about patient care a lot more than pharmacists do, and that's you know, got a lot of responsibility attached to that. They have a relationship with their patients which is um, quite intimate, and it's based on um, you know, access to kind of confidential information about their patients. And doctors are a lot more self-regulating than pharmacists are. And all this contributes to pharmacists being seen as a little bit kind of lower down in status than general practitioners. Now, I'm not endorsing that this is right. I'm not endorsing it's wrong. This is just me commenting on the situation. But who cares? What, why, why does it matter that pharmacists are kind of down here and general practitioners are up here? Why do we need to increase the professional profile of pharmacy? Um, the answer is that most people say, well, it does matter. Because if pharmacists aren't seen as, you know, well-trained medical professionals to whom patients can go for advice, we're going to get back to the old situation where people are just going to their GPs and asking about things that they could go to their pharmacist about. And that is beneficial for the patient as well. I would much rather pop into Boots on my way home than have to book a GP appointment, take an hour out of work, travel to my GP's, wait. So it's a lot more um, convenient for patients. But there's also benefit for pharmacists here. Um, websites such as this, which is eDrugNet.com. Has anyone watched The One Show? Yeah? Anyone see it last night? No, there was a thing on it about online pharmacy, um, which is basically a website like this. The number of people um, using these online pharmacies is increasing. In the USA, um, there's an absolutely huge market for these online pharmacies, right? Um, the, the sales for the UK are really, really difficult to come by, but in the USA in 2007... How much do you think total sales from online pharmacies totaled? How much do you think online pharmacies took? Sorry? No? Just throw me out a number. Sorry? Two billion. Twelve billion. Twelve billion dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? And that was in 2007. In 2008, 99,000 people a day were going through websites like this in the USA. Now, in the UK, it's a slightly different picture. We don't have an insurance-based model. And people that can't afford prescriptions in the UK are helped out by the government. But there is, the, the numbers are increasing, and there's a risk that people are kind of foregoing their pharmacy. They're not going to their high street pharmacist anymore. They're going to websites like this. And that's not good for pharmacists, and it's not good for patients. So pharmacists need to be seen as medical practitioners to whom patients can go for the benefit of patients and pharmacists. So the question is, can pharmacogenetics help then? How can pharmacogenetics help to increase the professional status of pharmacists so that these benefits can be taken by pharmacists and patients themselves? There's a number of ways in which pharmacists are seen as being able to get involved in pharmacogenetics. First of all, testing is likely to be this sort of thing, mouth swabs. Um, it's not particularly invasive testing. And pharmacists, you know, there's no reason a pharmacist couldn't do this in boots, is there really? Pharmacists could get involved in results interpretation. So results are fed back to the pharmacist, which are then fed back to the patient without the patient having to, you know, go off to the GP surgery during work time. And counselling, which is really twofold. Counselling about treatment options, you know, yes, Mrs. Smith, you've had this um, pharmacogenetic test and that means you can have this drug, but you can't have this drug. You know, just basic information given, but also genetic counselling. If patients are getting information which is a little bit problematic, you know, about risk factors of certain diseases, pharmacists could be trained to sort of give advice there. And this can increase the professional status of pharmacists because it gives them access to this cutting-edge, innovative technology that's more commonly associated with... Um, you know, people higher up this kind of hierarchy. They can change their relationship with patients, make them more intimate, more, more akin to what a general practitioner would have. 
with their patients. And it's said that pharmacists are in a great position to kind of head up some collaborative work in here and to sort of head up research teams um, and practice teams that can deliver this medicine effectively to patients. So that's all great, that's all rosy, but it's not all kind of butterflies and candy floss. There are some barriers here that need to be overcome. Now, we've already heard um, some barriers from the perspective of the development of the technology, but what I want to flag up is just a few barriers that need to be overcome in terms of putting it into practice, and particularly into pharmacy practice, okay? So this is a whole new territory for pharmacy, genetics in general and pharmacogenetics specifically. And there are a number of barriers which present themselves and these are really kind of twofold. We've got educational barriers and we've got practical barriers, okay? Now, first of all, there needs to be a reshuffle of pharmacology education, okay? The way that pharmacists are trained. Um, genetics need to be given a lot more prominence in that, um, in that training. There was a study done of pharmacology courses in 2005-2006, and it was found that 84% of universities were offering pharmacogenetic training. You might say, yeah, that's loads, but it's still 16% that aren't, okay? These range from one hour over the course of three years to 12 hours over the course of three years. So there's a huge sort of difference there. There's, there's a real lack of standardisation. And the risk is that this lack of standardisation leads to a generational knowledge gap. Whereas pharmacists who trained, you know, 25 years ago don't have the same level of knowledge that a as a pharmacist that trained last year, for example. And there's a risk that that impacts on patient experience because just because your local pharmacist in Boots doesn't have the same level of knowledge, you're not going to get access to the same quality of care just because your pharmacist doesn't have that same sort of knowledge. Now, training pharmacists in terms of um, how to use testing kits is, is a real key area, but this isn't new for pharmacists. Um, smoking cessation um, programmes are frequently run in pharmacies, and this involves pharmacists using technologies such as carbon monoxide monitors. Now, this is done where if you start on a smoking cessation programme, after four weeks of enrolment in that, you're, um, you have to do a sort of breathalyzer test, which is a carbon monoxide test, and it checks that you have actually genuinely stopped smoking, because if you haven't stopped smoking, you're off the program, you're wasting everyone's time. And clearly pharmacists are, are, are trained to use these, so training in medical technologies isn't new. What they need to be trained in is which kit to use at which time for which patient. And to be able to communicate this effectively with their patients, so their patients are getting the information that they need. And, of course, they need to be able to interpret the results effectively and, again, to tell the patients the information that the patients want to hear, not just a whole load of jargon, gobbledygook about, you know, what Munir was sort of talking about, you know, the big, long names of drugs and genes. You know, patients don't want to hear that information, OK? Um, then there's a whole set of kind of ethical issues around using um, genetic data. It's quite a sticky situation in medical practice using genetic material and effective um, strategies for the destruction of this DNA material needs to be put in place because, as we were hearing earlier, if the wrong sort of people get hold of this genetic material, you know, there's a potential for, for issues there. And even if the potential of these issues is somewhat exaggerated, you know, people like the Daily Mail still kind of jump on these things. There's a need to sort of protect yourself there from that. There's also a sense that pharmacists will need to be educated in um, how the patients are experiencing this. Because if a pharmacist is telling um, a patient one thing and their GP is telling them another thing, there's kind of conflicting information. And what this does is undermines the trust that people have in the pharmacist, which undermines the whole effort of increasing the professional status of the pharmacist, yeah? Then, of course, there are practical issues. Oh, practical issues, how much is it going to cost and what's it going to look like in practice. Pharmacies need to invest in these testing kits and they're expensive and there's a risk that they won't be used very often. So this idea of collaboration has been, has been put forward, which is where a whole group of pharmacists all club together and buy a set of kits. So rather than each pharmacy having all the kits, one pharmacy will specialise in testing for, say, older people's kind of medication, and another pharmacy will specialise in testing for um, genetic variations that commonly occur in the Asian population, for example. So it, it kind of, you know, sort of holds back the kind of um, financial outlay. Um, 
there's another issue which keeps constantly coming up, which is access to patient records. At the moment, do you know how much information pharmacists have about you? Sorry? Very, very little, yeah. All pharmacists have is what you take into their pharmacy, yeah, and they've got a record of that. They've got a record of every prescription that you've taken into that pharmacy. But if you then go and take one into the pharmacy down the road, they're not going to know about that, right? They use what information they do have to screen at the moment for drug-drug interactions. So where you're on one drug, if you're then prescribed another drug, they, they screen it for a risk that these two drugs are going to interact and cause something horrible to happen to you, basically. If um, genetic medicine becomes a much more common part of medical practice, they'll need information to screen for gene-drug interactions which at present they just do not have access to this sort of information. And of course that brings up loads of issues around privacy, confidentiality and trust. And all these issues are of course, you know, with um, putting pharmacogenetics into practice and these are notwithstanding the issues of time and bureaucracy around actually, you know, developing um, these products because of course if we're going to put them into practice they need to exist, you know, and the, the process of kind of developing these tests and developing these drugs is long, it's time consuming and it's bureaucratic. So I want to borrow a phrase um, that Valerie said earlier, which is tempered optimism, yeah? I don't want anyone to think that because there's a whole kind of complexity of barriers here that I'm being um, pessimistic, um, I, I'm not at all. I'm taking kind of tempered optimism about this. So to really quickly sum up then, um, today we've had a look at why would we look at pharmacy in relation to pharmacogenetics. And I've particularly talked about something that I'm really interested in, which is the professional profile of pharmacists and increasing that for the benefit of pharmacists themselves and their patients. I've talked about how can pharmacogenetics help with this. Um, and I've briefly gone through some barriers to overcome. And I'd like to invite any questions that you might have. That's good. Okay.